I'm Jim Knight, co-founder of the Instructional Coaching Group, and you're listening to Coaching Conversations, where I talk with coaching experts from around the world so that all of us can learn better ways to make an unmistakably positive impact on the people around us. Dr. Richardson, it is great to see you again. You've been a friend of ICG. I think a friend, I'd think like to think of you as a friend of mine for more than a decade. Mm-hmm. We're in the book, Focus on Teaching, came out back in 2014, and you created the course, Coaching for Connection, Certainty, and Autonomy for Radical Learners. You presented at TLC many, many times, more than five at least, I think. And you're a coaching leader, guiding coaching programs and help Hampton Schools, Virginia. You're a leader in Virginia ESCD. You're just an all-around force for good. So I'm super grateful that we're going to have this conversation. Thank you so much. Glad to be here. So what have you been up to since the last time we talked? I know you've got a lot of things going on, so I'm curious to hear what's new. A lot of things are going on. First, personally, I'm a grandma now. Congratulations. My my oldest, thank you, my oldest son um, and his wife, who used to be a student of mine when I was a prince, have a baby girl. Her name is Amora. She's seven months, and she got very tired of crawling after two weeks, and so she's already trying to walk. So that has been a a life-changing personal thing going on. Um, My middle son is graduating from college. So lots of um, family dynamics adjusting, but all for the good. So um, professionally, there's a lot going on um, with a lot of change, a lot of adjustments to funding sources, especially for coaches, as I'm sure you well know, Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of push for um, wellness and leadership. And so it's been very exciting to be in the educational space. You know, I still like to be in public ed so that I can speak about what's happening and what's happening now. And so um, just being able to be a resource for people, divisions, um, coaching leaders, whatever the case may be. And it's been really an honor to be able to speak to not just instructional needs and learning needs, but instructional leadership, um, whatever it is, because there are a lot of, um, a lot of um, impacts with our novice teacher pipeline, as you well know. And so that has changed the face of the classroom in a lot of different ways, which then does impact the way people, especially instructional coaches, support teaching and learning. So that's what I have been up to uh, this last year since we spoke last. Uh, Could you share like one or two things that that are fairly specific you're doing with instructional leaders? What are big things you're working on? Sure. One of the biggest things that I'm finding is that they have been very frustrated with the fact that things that they would normally do to support the teaching and learning, as I shared, is very different because of the lack of experience with some of the teachers that we are now, you know, experiencing being in classrooms. And so some of their toolkit or their tool belt, so to say, strategies that have worked for them in the past are are not working. And so really helping instructional leaders, no matter what that position is, to really understand that there has to be um, some scaffolding like we've never done before with skills, with awareness. You know, I have found with instructional leaders, you know, we like to send new teachers or, you know, new staff to go watch a classroom. But, you know, all of the research shows if a person is not aware enough to know where they currently are, then it's very difficult to look at another example and make the comparison to then make the step towards moving toward that example. So I know that was a lot, but really helping people understand it is a real true thing that people are unaware. And when they're unaware, they really cannot see where they are in their practice, what skills they do or do not have. So that's been a lot of conversation and to, you know, to stop the regular, let's send them to go see someone, let's give them a a book to read. But no, we have to have way more conversations and provide much more specific feedback to help build that awareness because you cannot move forward and change until you have that. And then you can see, oh, I'm here and I need to go there. That is huge. And that's been a a, a very uh, critical conversation that I've been having with a lot of people across the country as I'm supporting them, not just where I am. Yeah, we're we're putting it like this. Where am I now? Where do I want to get to? 
how am I going to get there? And where I want to get to is going to be what's the change I want to see in my students. And then once I've identified what I want to see in my students, what are the strategies to take us there? And then that just gets you started. Then you have to be in there and help the person make adjustments, make, make adaptations, be a learning partner with the person, instructional coach or whatever. For leaders, it's harder because they don't have as much time. They can, you know, spend mm -hmm. an hour a week with every teacher. Yes. So, um, especially like a high school. So figuring out, but, but knowledge that you can't put into action isn't all that helpful. So coming up Absolutely. with that actionable knowledge, you know, that's the key thing. Those get the, the goals that you said, it really is about that first question. Where am I now? And if you can't identify that, then you cannot do the rest of it. So a lot of folks found themselves stuck on that question, that part of it. And that's where I've been helping to hopefully provide some additional skills and tools so that they can move forward with goal setting and moving knowledge to action and practice. And that's why you're in the book on focus on teaching, because it's all about focusing on teaching, getting a clear picture of reality through video mostly, but lots of ways of doing it. And you know what we did with that, if you don't mind me interjecting this year, um, since usually your novice teachers are not aware of that first question, where am I now? We actually had a mini project um, here with our um, second year teachers to all videotape themselves or a small group during their instruction and, and do a view and a reflection with that and the the feedback has been coming out so positively about that experience and you know some of some people might be asking why second year teachers well they had the first year under their belt and they are probably more aware of what they're watching than they would have been last year so videotape is not just for yes it's for instructional practice and awareness but you know how else can we creatively think about who to videotape, when, what do we ask them as they're watching it together so that we have, you know, that similar point to talk about in our, in our triad. So that has been exciting. I just wanted to celebrate that. No, I think it's wonderful. I think it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, we have a whole course on that. So I, lo I love that idea. <laughs> Speaking of radical learners courses, you've got a course and in your course, you talk about psychological safety. So I've got three little questions related to this. There's not an absence of selfishness on my part because I want you to coach me a little bit too, but how can leaders create psychological safety? What's a couple things a leader can do? By leader, I mean, we're all leaders, but I mean, people in positions, leadership positions like assistant principals, principals, superintendents, people who are um, evaluating people, leading, leading the, the overall direction of the school. So what can they, people in those kind of positions do to create psychological safety? Well, I'm so glad you asked because it's one of the um, the critical elements that's going to help us, you know, have that foundational piece for a classroom or school climate and culture. So I just want to just define it for people that may not know. It's really about that perception that I have that I feel safe to take interpersonal risks. So do I feel comfortable sharing my ideas in this team meeting or asking questions of my administrator or making mistakes and taking those risks without negative consequences or, you know, just that punishment or, or ridicule or whatever it may be. So I think that leaders really need to think about, you know, holistically, what is the environment that I am providing to all of the people in this space, this department, this school? Um, what are the morale essentials that they are focusing on? Um, how are they encouraging communication? But a big one right now, especially in this very tense time um, before the election and, and different things that are going on, you know, how can a leader or anyone value the differing opinions and ideas that other people have? Um, it doesn't mean that you always have to host them all in a space. But how can you value the perspectives, hear the ideas, and not only that, hear it, but then empathize and understand in order to properly support them and move forward? So I think that's one of the biggest things leaders can do and however you define leader. Um, because if we're not able to make the space to hear and we're supporting teachers or, or employees or all the educators we have to understand where that person is coming from, just like we're asking teachers to, you know, be culturally responsive for the students and understand who they are, where they are, because they bring that whole person to the classroom where a whole person comes to work also. 
So that will really be, I mean, that's the highlights that I wanted to share about the psychological safety and leaders specifically. Well, you know, it's interesting. When I get reviews for things I write, I ask my editor to send them, send that to people who don't like my work. Um, and uh, I wish that was a very short list, but they don't have any trouble finding people. But at any rate, um, those people, not necessarily don't like, but who, who would, would be quick to criticize. And those people give me much better information than people who love my work. And because people who love my work to say, well, this is great. Don't change anything. But the critical people actually give me more information. So as you were talking, I was thinking as a leader, even though I might not share the same views of this person, because they have a different view, maybe I, I can learn something. And then it seems to me the other thing that was going on in my head was um, they don't think they're bad people. So their, their views to me might not be good for human beings. I might see things differently, but the, but the impetus behind the intent behind them is not to be bad. It's they think this is good. So if I can somehow see where that's coming from and I can see their views as ways to learn, I, I'm thinking those are two ways of addressing what you're talking about. Absolutely. We have to see it as valuable. Um, we have to see that the other ideas and vantage points are beneficial to the whole program. If we don't at least have that to think that this is going to help me because you said, Ed, I want to see it because I know it's going to help me. Well, then we have to back up a few steps and we have to help leaders and whoever else realize the more ideas and diversity you have at the table for the ideas, the better, the stronger, um, the more far reaching that plan or idea will be. Um, I was just watching someone and I was trying to think about I was watching um, Jennifer, what is her name? Jennifer Brown. Um, she's very big in the DEI space. Mm -hmm. And she was talking about, you know, that iceberg that we always see, you know, with what's on the top, your behaviors, and then what's underneath, you know, your values, core values, or, or whatever it was. But she had a graphic um, that said, you know, that waterline goes down or, or the further down the waterline goes, meaning the further up um, that you see, not just what my behaviors are, but that you see my gender, my introversion, extroversion, my family status, you know, then that contributes to that psychological safety. It blew my mind and I'm so glad I was able to recall it. But, you know, it is the 10% tip of the iceberg, but the lower that waterline goes down, the more I am able to safely show who I am and then if I'm showing it safely, that means you're seeing it and valuing it as well. So, mm -hmm. oof, and that's hard to do. You know, that means I, as a leader, have to be reflective enough to say, am I valuing the voices of the people around me? And if I'm not, why not? It, it asks you as a leader to be pretty self-reflective on who you are and what you believe. I mean, it's hard for me to open up to another person if I'm not really clear on what my values and beliefs are, who I am. So I'm I really think a huge part of compassion, empathy, understanding is to see my own frailties, my own limitations, my own pain when I experience pain. And so it's easier for me to see it in other people. And very, very interesting. So what about coaches? Do, is, is there something special for coaches in terms of creating psychological safety? Because you want a, a safe conversation or else you're not going to probably get too far. Yes. One of the biggest things coaches can do, and I, I have done it. Um, for TLC, many places where I go, you know, it, it's about trust. Mm -hmm. Coaches and the people that they support, you know, a classroom um, is a teacher's space. It's who they are. It's their professional identity. And so when coaches are coming in to who I am and where I am doing this work, they have to be able to be trusted. Um, a coach may be putting out different components or elements of trust, you know, either Birkenschneider's five elements or, you know, the competency, um, respect, integrity, personal regard, reliability, whichever ones you use, I have to, as a coach, and I call it put, put out behaviors that would um, develop or engender all of those things with a coachee or, or a teacher and I can't. So what, what do I mean? 
So I can't just go in and say, I know this. This is what we have to do. This is what the math department said, or this is what the, the district said. That's competency. But that person that I'm supporting may not care a uh, lick about what I know <laughs> and, and where to find it. They may just be looking to see if I care about them as a human being or if I'm valuing their voice. So as coaches and leaders, we have to purposely and intentionally and inge- uh, put out behaviors that would support all of the trust elements or facets or whatever you call it so that they can begin to see you as trustworthy and then you will be able to be seen as a, a partner in that space. As you know, you can't really support the teaching and learning um, if, if it's not a partnership because the teacher will not feel safe and it, it brings it all back in. So I think the trust, the engendering trust is one of the biggest things coaches um, can do. And in a recent conversation I had after a, a keynote, you know, I was speaking to a coach and they said, it's just so crazy that I was in the classroom. I can remember the experiences and I can share with them, but they don't see me as an equal because I was there. I'm not there now. And so that is something that coaches really have to think about because we see a teacher, we're like, oh my gosh, yes. I remember I did that. I can help you. But we are not seen automatically as a partner because we're no longer, as I call it, in the in the in the war fields with them. And so you have to get past all of that in order for them to see you as a partner. So I know that was a lot, but well, but I think that I think the sorry if I cut you off, but I think I think what you're saying is critical. You've got to communicate to foster trust. Um, There's a lot that's involved in in all those things. For me, one of the big things is it's clear that I have an attitude of benevolence towards you. And I'm really concerned about your success, not just my success. If it's all about me, it's hard for me to trust that person. But if I can tell that they want to they want what's best for me or for kids, I can see that benevolence, I'd trust them. But what I, what I heard you saying here in particular is you, you also, in fostering trust, you have to communicate that we're, we are partners. That's there in the way you ask questions. It's the way in, in you tentatively share ideas. To me, it's always about letting the other person know they're making the decision. So I'm going to share this idea, then you tell me what you think, as opposed to, oh, you have to do it this way. Now, what about teachers? Do you think psychological safety the ideas about psychological safety apply in a classroom oh yes um because they're hopefully able to recognize that that's what they're trying to do for their their own students they may not use that term they may use you know safe and nurturing classroom environment but it's still about um helping their coach to see that i have a welcoming and inclusive environment for my students um i've established clear rules, routines, procedures, expectations. I want my kids to be able to take risks and learn from their mistakes, you know, and not judge them. So the teacher can model it and demonstrate it while working with a coach. And so hopefully they'll be able to put themselves in the driver's seat, so to say, and then recognize that they're now also in the learner's seat with their coach. So that's one of the things that I Um, If I'm working with coaches or teams and trying to help them recognize that you're the learner in this partnership, but so is the coach. But then you're also modeling this with your learners in your classroom. So the more we can help them with that and understand that, um, I have found that to be most successful. So if the teachers are able to get past, you're not one of us, (laughs) but really start to see from the trust um, that the coach is trying to put out that, yes, this person is here for to support me, my efforts, my students, and let's get down to business and do mm. this work. Yeah. Very interesting. Now, another, another part of uh, the course you wrote was about autonomy and control. Mm. So can you tell me why you think autonomy? It's interesting to put those two words sort of side by side. But why do you think uh, professional autonomy is important? And this is coming from somebody who's written a lot about the power of it, but I'd like to hear your take. Well, autonomy, um, when I spoke about it in the course, I was really making the connection to the fact that it is one of the the things that our brain needs in order to feel safe. 
And so when we think about autonomy, usually people are thinking, I have I have all of the control in the decision making that I'm doing. Um, but sometimes it's just about owning the work because, you know, none of us in education are going to work and making it up. Right. We have standards. We have expectations. We are following federal, state, local guidelines, whatever it may be. So I have to understand um, for my brain to feel safe, what is in my span of control? What is tight? As we say, uh, the PLC folks in the, in the divorce used to always say, what is tight and what is loose? Mm. Once somebody knows, okay, this is tight, this has to be done, then I can decide, oh, okay, but it's loose for me about how I do this. Excuse me, when I work with the coaches, um, I always tell them the more you can peek open the eyes of the teacher to see where they do have their personal autonomy, that is where they'll be able to foster their own creativity and innovation because that is where they can set loose. So it doesn't just mean I'm all willy nilly doing whatever I want, whenever I want, but within and identifying what is in place and has to be my professional autonomy is where I can spread my wings, put my own voice on it, you know, two third grade classrooms next to each other following the same curriculum may have two completely different looks when you go in one of those rooms and then out and into the other one because of where that teacher is able to put them themselves in there. And again, because who we are should match as much as possible what we do, you know, the work that I do with identity, the more that I could bring me into my work, the more resolved I will be able to be when conflicts might come in the way. Mm. Very cool. Yeah. So uh, do you think there are misconceptions about autonomy? I think you're already kind of alluding to them that it's just like it's willy nilly, do whatever the heck you want. That's not what you're saying. But are there any other sort of yeah. misconceptions about it? Some misconceptions are that um, it should be understood. I've heard that in many places like, um, you know, mm -hmm. coaches will come or teachers will come and a response might be, well, it should have been understood a particular, you know, Ex, uh, expectation but if they're not if the expectations or the tight things are never communicated regularly often and in multiple ways by whoever decided that that was what needed to happen then there is a whole lot of confusion I won't call it a misconception but it has to be explicit if the expectation is to use the pacing guide that's provided by the district then that needs to be communicated by the person that has set that expectation and that helps coaches, especially coaches, be able to go back and say, oh, okay, so the expectation is ABC, what would mm -hmm. you like to do given that information? So that is one of the things that is most critical that I talk to coaches about. And I say, well, who told you that you guys had to do that? So they'll say, uh, nobody really said it, but it's just understood. Right. Okay, no, let's clear. let's get clear on that. Are we sure? Because sometimes, as you know, um, um, de-implementation or have we taken anything off and if we never explicitly say that either oh no we're not doing that this year have we said that are we not using something because what appears is that every year there's something new have we ever taken anything off so that is something that could so help professional autonomy is when whoever it is that is in charge whatever level that is of education even if it's in the classroom or at the school let's be explicit about that so that people do know where they will be able to exercise their personal autonomy. This might be taking it too far, but I'm wondering if I'm wondering if I'm wondering if what you're saying is this that if there are expectations that I want others to do, the responsibility is on me to make sure they know it. I shouldn't just send an email and say, well I sent an email. Didn't you read the email? I should make sure the way I communicate expectations as landed. And we all know we lead workshops or in the classroom or whatever. You can say it, but it doesn't mean that people will necessarily hear it. I don't know. I, I mean, I, I've never probably ever done a workshop where I haven't said, here's what you need to do. And then two minutes yeah. later, <laughs> just, what is it we're supposed to do? So so I, does that sound right to you that the expectation is on me, the leader, to make sure that other people get it? Um, yes. Strong? Yes. And, and I'll, I'll tell on myself, you know, I was a, a building leader. Um, sometimes it's not comfortable to share what it is we want people to do. Sometimes it's easier for me to 
pass that communication on down to folks like coaches. And so sometimes yeah. coaches are the ones telling teachers what they should be doing, what they have to do. But if I'm your partner, it's going to be hard for me to tell you what you have to do. I'm not even the one that decided that. And it's not about passing the buck. It's about being able to say as a coach or support of whatever area, the expectation is this. This is where it came from. And, and hopefully also communicated. And that is why. That's one of the biggest things that teachers need in order to understand why they have to do something. Is it just a laundry list? Or, you know, the 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 research shows. I was just talking to a, a group about um, teacher collective efficacy. Here's, here's the research. And so in order to be able to maximize um, the opportunity to have teacher collective efficacy, then we want to make sure that we're doing this, this, and this. So what is best to do, and I'm trying to be really careful, is we don't want to pass on communicating the expectation to someone who didn't create the expectation because it makes it difficult for them to support the next group of people in putting that implement, putting that expectation into practice. It's best if wherever that decision came from, they communicate it so that we're able to, as results coaching training says, hold up that standard and show people where it came from and why that's best. But we have to be careful as coaches that, that we don't say, well, I don't know why we're doing that, but so-and-so said to, so, right. you know, let's just figure it out. No, that's not what I'm saying. But we need to be able to understand and bring it back to, hey, this email you know, really lays out from the superintendent or from the the deputy instructional coordinator or whoever, um, the three strategies that they want us to use in reading this year. And so what do you know about those strategies? Can I help you find some, you know, some reading on that so that we can learn together? And then we, in partnership, can start to figure out how you want that to look in your whole group lesson versus um, you have to do these three strategies, um, I didn't see it in your lesson. Did you hear the difference between those? The partnership approach versus right. I'm just be directive. And teachers will never receive that level of directiveness because that's not my role as a as a coach. As a coach, I'm there to support you, not direct you. So I want to make sure that I find where the tight came from if it wasn't explicitly communicated. And it doesn't even need to just be that, Jim. It could be you know, best practices, our instructional playbooks, whatever those things may be, where are they? Do we have them to be able to show, remind, bring back? You know, let's look at three best practices for supporting our, you know, intervention groups. Which one might be um, advantageous for you to try with your group? So that's just one of the things I'm telling you. I know I talked a lot about it, but that's one of the biggest things that can happen to promote the partnership is that the expectations are clear, communicated, the why behind it, and then I, as the coach or support specialist or whatever it is that, you know, instructional lead, team leads, can then be in one accord with you. We both understand this. Where do we go? What do we want to do? What's tight? What's loose? Well, it applies in the classroom, too. We'll, if our expectations oh, yes. aren't clear, if our explanations aren't clear, it's not going to happen. If you can't explain it clearly and they don't hear you, it's not going to happen. One of the biggest things I hear, because I talk a lot about autonomy as well, is how do you balance out uh, coherence and autonomy? And so I'm wondering what you think. How does a How does a leader bring those two things together? Or do we say, actually, coherence doesn't matter. All I need is motivated teachers. So I'm wondering what you think about how those two pieces hold together. I mean, I I, I think it is very similar to what I just said. You know, how right. do we figure out what it is that the organization is asking for the school, the district, and set the clear boundaries and expectations, and then also be clear on what the flexibility is for the individuals mm -hmm. so that they can approach it with their unique perspectives and ideas within the parameters. So that I, I believe it's the same thing. You know, where is it tight? Here's where we're going. Here's what we're, we're doing. Here's what the strategic plan is saying. This is what we're going to do. And then we're communicating the expectations. And now where can I flex my muscles? Where, where do I get to put in my, you know, personal approach to it or my style or my idea within the parameters? And, you know, the research, even with students, as you give them too many choices, it's very flustering. 
you know, if you have this limit of choices or this this space to be able to have that choice, then that is is most productive for people. And the way I think about, I've been thinking about this recently, it, and uh, and you're kind of reinforcing my thinking is whether you like it or not, people have autonomy. So no one's going to do something unless they choose to do it. So you can say, well, I'm going to tell them and they better do it. But we've all lived through program after program where this is what the what you're going to do and it doesn't happen because without choice, it doesn't. So I think if you want real coherence, you have to acknowledge autonomy and, and you have to set things up so people are going to choose to do what the coherent pattern is. Without acknowledging that, it's pretty hard to to move forward. In other words, autonomy is an essential part of coherence giving people autonomy so they can choose. Otherwise, it ain't going to happen. And we have to we have to have a sense of autonomy in order for our brains to feel safe and to move towards people um, from David Rock's research. So no, if someone is feeling up against the wall, they're going to find where they have control because that is, that is what we're going to naturally do. So we want to be able to help people have, you know, the decision making in areas where they can and direct themselves where they can. But if you don't have any autonomy, right. people will begin to search it out and find it in the in the best ways that they can. Yeah, I said you have to have autonomy for coherence, but you probably also have to have coherence for autonomy. It probably goes both ways. Without those structures, clear expectations, here's what we do, here's what we don't do. I just say do whatever the heck you want might be kind of fun, but it's probably not going to, it's not genuine autonomy. So that's, that's a great point. Uh, you mentioned earlier on, these are troubling times. And I, I would say we're living through twin plagues, at least multiple plagues, really, because there's concerns about the climate and the future. But two things in particular, to me, are polarization and misinformation, which kind of feed each other. We don't have a real sense of what's real and true and certain. Um, and, and so we look for something to hold on to, to feel grounded. And then that means we seek out more and our computers are giving us support to do that. So we, we are sort of teaming up one against the other, one group against another group, increasing polarization, increasing lack of clarity. And that makes people angry and sad and traumatized. And so... I don't know if you're seeing it this way, but I'm just seeing a lot of educators who are a lot of people, not just educators who are not as joyful as they've been in the past. And maybe it's a lot worse than that. Maybe he's struggling. So um, how can we help others when we see them having a hard time coping with what's happening in our world today? That was such a big question. And I'm trying I to know I was just thinking I'm asking oh, to solve okay. the world right now. Well, I, I will make a connection to um, what I am seeing in, in some research and data that I've come across recently. Um, I want to put one word on it. I want to put belonging. Yeah. Um, so I was in a, I think they are um, up, upbeat um, in a recent webinar where they had new correlational data showing that, you know, high staff belonging, high organizational belonging um, correlates I, it correlates with mm. retention. And so when I'm thinking about what you were saying, I was thinking about, um, you know, sometimes we have those those um, conflicting conversations or those very sharp, um, intense situations. Sometimes when we do not feel the sense of belonging of where we are, you know, that the belonging that we're a part of something bigger and that we connect to other people's values and that we, again, feel respected or cared about in the place where where we are but belonging is also about do I feel like I have something to contribute I think it was Cohen's research about you know it's the feeling of belonging it's the larger group and do I have something to contribute and sometimes when those environments can be very tense we may not feel that way um I'm not saying I've seen anything explicit about polarization versus belonging, but I do know where there are staffs that have that high sense of belonging. It's not a toxic positivity and it's not a kumbaya, but it is, you know, I've got positive relationships with my colleagues. I've got positive relationships with, you know, within the school climate. 
I have positive relationships with my leader. I have a sense of belonging and that can sometimes serve as a buffer. Um, or I guess I'm thinking about, you know, like the bumper cars, like a bumper to some of those things that can, that can rise up. Um, you know, and the teacher has a responsibility of, you know, managing my own, um, mental and physical health and my job performance and my own motivation, but belonging has a huge part to play with it. So I think that, um, you know, as coaches or coach leaders, if we can do our best job to listen, you know, we don't always have to debate the topic, but we can listen if someone asks for direction on correct information versus misinformation or trying to filter it into their brain, you know, we can do that. We can always offer support, offer an ear without feeling like we have to try to fix it. But, um, you know, how often can we encourage open dialogue? I'm, I'm doing some cultural responsiveness work, um, have been doing some of that work on a team since covid and so there are not many spaces people have identified. There aren't a lot of spaces to be able to have open dialogue. And so also that piece may lend to some of the tension because if my only conversation was with you here, then I'm going to maybe share where I could have had a more productive conversation in, in a space that was that was going to hold that up. So open dialogue, how can we help people just think critically? And as coach is one of the biggest things and it connects to my my session I'm doing for you, you know, one of the biggest things we can do is be intentional with our questions and not necessarily lead people down certain roads with our questions, but just to help them be more mindful about their own thinking, their own being, their own actions. So I don't know if we can solve it. I don't know if I, I can, I said I could provide a strategy to solve it, but one of the biggest things we can do is listen and to help give back what we're hearing to people. Sometimes they may not even realize what they're saying until they hear it back. And like, oh no, that's not what I meant. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, that might be what you said, or that's not how you said it. So that's why coaching is so powerful with all of the communication skills. Because if we can just open, have safe space, you know, that's my model of space. Coaching is a space for people to think, grow, and create. Then we can give that back and hopefully help to minimize some of that um, that very difficult waters to to swim through, especially now. This is when my phone starts ringing off the hook from now till November. I'm going to have calls. My mentee didn't do this, and I can't believe that they want to vote for someone. I'm telling you, it is the season, and I try to provide, you know, well, did you talk to them? Did you listen? Or did you just try to go ahead and defend your own stance versus just being open and just being there to to hear it and to support people. It's hard because, you know, we want to defend, we want to, yeah. um, you know, to share our part. We want to get in the conversation. Sometimes it is just about stepping back and just recognize that I'm going to give this space to this person. It's not about me. Margaret Wheatley in her, her most recent books, she talks about creating islands of sanity. And I think that's kind of what you're talking about. It could be crazy out there. But at least we can create this setting where we feel like each other has each other's back. We're, 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 we, we, well, belonging. Your word is a really good one, belonging. Now I have this question. I asked you last okay. year, so you could just repeat the same answer if you want, but <laughs> are, there, are there a couple, one or two or three good questions, practices, strategies, tools, things you could say that they would really help with respect to coaching or happiness or coaching and or happiness? So what are some thoughts you could share that we could use, things we could use, whether it's a question or an idea or a strategy or whatever? Oh, well, um, we're doing a lot of that now. You know, the, mm -hmm. it, it is still difficult times in schools and the classrooms. So, you know, one of the biggest things that we can do and ask people about is, you know, why they started doing this in the first place. You know, and remind them about that, their why. You know, your why mm -hmm. is your personal GP. And if I can still find my why in the midst of this. And that's one of the biggest things that, you know, that you can ask someone, you know, what is it that you want for your kids? You know, those forward question, forward facing question, forward pointing questions. It, it, and it aligns with, you know, all of the peer schools, everything. Where, where do you want this to go? What do you see happening? But I have found this year, I've had to ask a lot of, why did you go into education in, in the first place? And you get that, you always get that, oh, you know, I wanted to so-and-so, or 
I wanted to be a teacher ever since I was three, lining up my right. baby dolls and teach in the backyard. Right. You know, and then you have this, okay. So if this is what you wanted and this is where you are, how can we best overlap that and just help them remember the passion if it's not there anymore? Um, you know, sometimes just the awakening of the reality of teaching sometimes is is difficult for folks and to help them, you know, just grapple with the reality and help them make those those connections. And start with why. Yeah, start with why um, and help them remember their own personal why and 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 get them moving forward. And I'll say it again because just it was it was the research that I did and it was very powerful. The more aligned your personal and professional identity are, the more successful, vested, you know, aligned coherent your practice will be. And so how can we help to mm -hmm. merge further those two circles of the Venn so that their professional and personal self are aligning? And that is above the iceberg and below. Mm -hmm. That's very, very interesting. And it, it works for teams too. If the whole team has an alignment around their why, then you've got that belonging you're talking about too. So I think that's really, really powerful. So one last question. What can you tell us about what people will see if they come to TLC? And it's Ooh. it's selling quickly, like the spaces are going. I think they heard your presentations coming at it. It's, it's selling at <laughs> Well, I, my session specifically, um, I'll speak to in a minute, but if you're listening to this and you have never been to this conference, it is one of these spaces where you are like, these are my people um, and topics, absolutely everything. And, and the, the best keynotes, and what I love about the keynotes is, you know, there are people in industries that aren't even necessarily where I would make a connection to coaching, but I do. And it, and it makes, lets me nerd out a little bit and, and also just, um, the networking and the and the the collaboration and the the energy of TLC. Oh my gosh! See, I'm getting chills. So let me let me stop stop talking about it. But this year, um, I'm at, I spoke to it. I'm actually talking about um, inquiry, um, the questions. It is to master it. It's an art. So I called it mastering the art of inquiry. I think um, because questioning is one of the biggest tools we can have, and it's not even just about having a list of questions, but understanding. Questions put you on the offensive, and I'm not a sports person, but when we can um, provide to a teacher an offensive strategy, such as a question, we want to make sure that it is the right question that's going to bring about the most thoughtfulness, um, because we know that we want them to be able to make these decisions for themselves. We want them to be vested in their goal. So I'm going to just show some different types of um, questions that people can add to their tool belt to really help them understand. This isn't something that I just launch out of my mouth accidentally. You should be intentional with questions. Um, and you should know how to use a specific question so that you can get the outcome that you need. So, you know, and I don't mean offensive, like we're going to then, you know, be people up again, but... It helps a question. You know, if, you, if you're if you talking and someone asks you a question, what do you do? You answer it. It stops you from talking and you answer the question. So as coaches, if questions usually get answered just because of our social expectations or whatever, when you're asked a question, you, you usually answer it. So let's, let's take that knowledge. Let's skillfully develop mastery over inquiry. And you know that we're going to have some coaching going on at my session and you know we're going to be very hands-on and turn and talk and also have some space for reflection so i am very excited and grateful for the opportunity to come again well people always love your presentations and i love the chance i get to learn with you now more than a decade i'm grateful for your friendship grateful for your ideas and uh is it possible to be grateful for the future anyway in my mind i'm grateful for what's going to happen next too so thank you so much Thank you. It's going to be amazing. And I just appreciate the uh, space that you've created for this most important work because every, every kid deserves the best teacher possible.